Thank you. Blessings. Welcome. It's good to see you. How many of you are happy to be here today? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, if, if you're happy about being here, we'll have a good time together. It's a time to worship. In these, in these moments, I want us to think about refreshing. If you notice the outline was simply titled the message, When Life is Refreshing. I got up this morning, and the first thing I noticed in, from my window was the bright sunshine. My first thought was, it's refreshing to have beautiful sunshine today. Now, the truth is, that is one level of refreshing. Some of you got out of the shower this morning, and the first thought was, man, that's refreshing. And it is a type of refreshing. But I want to talk about spiritual refreshing, something that happens within your very being. We could call it your soul. We could call it your spirit. But it's within you. It's your feelings. It's your emotions. It's your spirit of person that is being refreshed and lifted and encouraged by the Spirit of the Lord. And I want us to begin by looking at Psalms 119, uh, verses 1 and 11. As we uh, go through this psalm, I want to just sort of uh, note some things for, to highlight for you. Um, the writer of Psalms is, uh, writes it as a hymn of praise magnifying the Word of God. He just simply talks about how great the Word of God is to him. He began in verse 1, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless. The word blessed is an important word. It relates to something making you overwhelmingly happy, not just happy. I'm happy every day. But ever so often, something happens that makes me just overwhelmingly happy. I'm excited about being happy. So that's what it really means. It just relates to you being so happy in the Lord that it's hard to contain yourself. So blessed are those whose ways are blameless. Now, the word blameless is a word that you probably don't use that often. However... If any of you have ever gone to grade school, you can remember back somewhere along the way, there was another student that blamed you for something that you didn't think you sh should have been blamed for. Maybe it's over a pencil. Maybe it was over a piece of paper. Maybe it was talking out loud. They blamed you. Happy. Excitingly happy is the person who stands before God without blame. No one's accusing you of dropping the pencil or talking out loud. Verse 2, or let's, let's stay with verse 1. Who's blameless, who walks according to the law of the Lord. It's important to realize in your daily walk, your journey is according to God. Blessed are those who keep his statue and seek him with all their heart. The word seek, related to you and me, just simply in our hearts, our minds, seeking all of God. How much of God do you really want in your life? Do you want just a small measurement of God, enough to make you miserable? Or do you want enough of God in your heart to make you hilariously happy? Many Christians are miserable today because they've just got enough of God to make them miserable. They don't know how to enjoy Him. They don't know how to enjoy the Word. They're miserable. They grunt and groan about Cause they're a Christian they can't do. Cause they're a Christian they can't be. Dear friends, when your life is right with God, you can do all the things that God wants you to do. You can be all the things God wants you to be, and you'll be happy about it. That's what the Bible says. And we must live according to the Scripture. Do I hear an amen? amen. All right. We're on page together. But notice this. Blessed are those who seek Him with all their hearts. They do no wrong but follow God's ways. 
Uh, that's a tough one for us, isn't he? The, he changes his tone a little bit for verse 4. Now, verses 1, 2, and 3, he's magnifying the, uh, how happy he is to, in, in the Lord. But verse 4, he comes to it being honest with himself and says, Lord, you have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Now, he's taking note here that the word of God is intended to be obeyed. Now, keep in mind, he's happy. He's acknowledging the word of God is to be obeyed. And then notice he begins to talk about himself in verse 5. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decree. What he's saying, he said, I have found some errors in my life that's not in your will. I have found some areas in my life where I have not honored you, I have not recognized you, I have not loved you as I should have. And I, he said, I'm just acknowledging that. And the first step to being happy is to acknowledge that there's a problem and then you fix the problem and you're happy about it. Did you ever have a squeaking door in your house? I mean, every time you open the door, it squeaked, especially the closet door. It just squeaks. But one day, the strong man of the house puts a little uh, oil on the door hinge, and all of a sudden, the squeak is gone, and everybody's happy about it. Well, it's admitting there's a problem. But notice verse 6. Then he said, I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. In other words, if I'd been obeying your word in the first place, God, if I'd been obeying your word, I was not having to be on the apologetic side. If I obeyed your word, I'd be okay. But then he says, I will praise you with an upright heart. I will praise you. I will be happy in you. As I learn your righteous laws, God, the more I learn about you, the more I learn about you. There's a song um, that uh, I remember from my younger uh, life. The more I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Great lyrics. The more I serve him, the greater he goes. And that's what the, the psalmist is saying here. The more I serve him, the more praise I give to him, I learn of his righteous laws. I will obey your decree and do not utterly forsake me. Lord, I will obey you. I will serve you. Please don't walk out on me. He's talking about his life being refreshed. Now, it's up to you and me about how our lives are refreshed or not. If we are going to be refreshed, then we're going to have to recognize some things with God that we may not want to. We may want to say, God, I have failed you today. Now, what does it mean to fail God? If God has asked you to do something and you bypassed it, you failed him. Are you hearing me? Now, there are some areas that you just, if you, if you don't read your Bible, you're failing God. If you don't pray and talk to God about your life, you're failing God. David said, Lord, I don't want to fail you. I don't want to fail you. And as you and I, listen to this statement very carefully. As you and I live to please God, we will find our lives are being overly blessed with his spirit, refreshing us, renewing himself within us, Moment by moment, we feel God's presence, and we know that his love is with us. But number one in the outline, refreshing is present when a person's attitude is to please God. Refreshing is when a person's attitude is to please God. Now, there's two important words. One is attitude, and one is to please. Some of you got up this morning with the attitude, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to worship, I'm going to enjoy. And some of you got up with the attitude, I'm just going to church. Now, and now you've left it up to the preacher and the worship leader to get you in the spirit of worship. 
Why? You should have left home in the spirit of worship. Wherever you are as a child of God, God is present. And for sure, when we come to the house of God corporately to worship him, we come into his abiding presence. He's promised to be with us and to bless us. It's the promise of God. Refreshing. Your life can be dull or it can be refreshing. Which do you want? You're in charge. If you want a refreshing life, there are just some things that you're going to need to do, and let's talk about them. For instance, for Noah, Noah was an inter- interesting character. And uh, in the uh, book of uh, Genesis, in chapter 6 and 7, there's some things there that are just very important. God had come to a pl- time in the, his uh, life with the world that he had become disappointed. People were turning their backs on him, and they had turned to the way of sin. Apparently, everyone except Noah and his family. And so God is going to just close out all all of earth and start over again. And he says to Noah, says to Noah in verse 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. He walked faithfully with God. That's an important key Walk faithfully with God. Now, God has a responsibility for Noah. He needed a faithful man. He knew he could trust Noah. He knew he could depend on Noah to follow through. So he gives Noah the responsibility of building an ark. He tells Noah exactly how he wants the ark built. And now notice in uh, verse 22... Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Now, God gave Noah a project, told him how to build the project, and God said Noah did exactly the way it was supposed to have been done. He didn't take any extra steps. He didn't leave anything out. He did exactly God's command. We're not through here. He's built the ark. God looks at it. God's approved. Now, God says to Noah, we've got the ark built. I want you to bring all two of all the living creatures into the ark. Noah brought all those creatures into the ark, put them in their place in the ark. God closed the door. But notice in verse 5 of chapter 7, and Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah did all that God commanded I am convinced by, by Noah doing all that God had commanded him that Noah was very, very happy. He felt refreshed, walking with God, pleasing God. Have you ever pleased God? Sure, sure you have. You remember how it feels to please God? Now here's my question. Why don't we intently please God all the time? All the time. Well, there's some things I want to do that God may not want to do. Oh, that's an honest commitment on your part to be honest about it. But think about it. Is it what God wants you to do or is it what you want to do? If you are going to please God, then it's what God wants you to do that counts. I've been there and done both, so I know what what I'm talking about. When we talk about refreshing, I've got to talk about myself. I want you to think about yourself. Sometimes we get so full of ourselves. It's all about what I want. It's all about what I want to do, where I want to go, what I'm thinking, what my plans are, that God's not included. God's not included. Now, when you don't include God in your life, your life is going to be dull. Did you hear me? 
When you don't include God in your life, your life is going to be dull. Every one of you, if you've been a Christian very long and been going to church very long, can remember and note there is someone that you know by name, used to go to church all the time. And one day, they went on a vacation. They was gone from church two or three weeks. Vacation was over. Next Sunday came, they were not at church. The next Sunday, they were not at church. The next Sunday, they were not at church. And by then, you saw them, you said something to them about missing them at church, and they said, oh, we've just been too busy. What happened? They became dull. They lost their refreshing spirit. They no longer had an interest in God, no longer had an interest in fellowship with God's people. A dull spirit, a dull spirit of being filled with themselves. Filled with themselves. One time I said to a gentleman about he and his family not being in church. I I just simply said, uh, uh, I've been missing you. I I knew you went on vacation, but I haven't seen you lately. And he said, these very words to me. He said, well, pastor, to be honest with you, after we took a three-week vacation, we came home, the lawn had to be mowed and laundry had to be done that, that weekend before we went back to work on Monday. That put us out of church four weeks. And you know, by the time five weeks came around, wife and I talked about it. We just realized we didn't need God anymore. We were just as happy without God as we were with God. What happened? So filled with themselves, they became dull toward God. You've experienced that a day at a time, maybe. I hope not for a long period of time. But look with me, if you would, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Jesus talks about some attitudes that we have And Jesus said, watch out for false prophets, for they come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. He's talking about people who pretend to be what they're not. Pretending to be a Christian when they're not a Christian, maybe. Pretending to be a servant of God when they want to take advantage of people. Pretending. He had no use for pretenders. Pretending people are not happy people. But notice in Matthew 9 and 20, Jesus relates to a good attitude. Now, relating to a good attitude, he just simply pulled out a faith person, a story by faith. And he tells a story about a lady who had had a disease I think the Bible says for 12 years and go to many doctors, but no doctor had had been able to bring correction to her disease. And she thought to herself, but if I may just simply touch the outer garment, the cloak that he's wearing, as she talked about Jesus, I will be made whole. And she made her way through the crowd And she got to Jesus, and she touched his garment. And instantly, Jesus recognized the spirit of healing went out from him to that lady. An attitude to please God, to recognize, to serve, to face my weaknesses, to face my problems, to face my own handicaps, to let God correct them. And sometimes it's by physical healing or spiritual healing or attitude healing. I want to back up to Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. There's something there that's very, very important to us that I I want us to look at before uh, I bypass it too, too far. 
In verse 11, the Apostle Paul is the writer, and he says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. To understand that, you, I needed to explain verse 10. Verse 10 talks about Jesus. It talks about Jesus in the fact that the death that he died, he died to sin. The life that he lives, he lives unto the Father. Likewise, we need to consider ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desire. Don't, don't allow yourself to be put in the position to where evil desires are stronger than righteous desires. The stronger one's going to win. You have to protect yourself from the wiles of the environment that is around you. If you don't protect yourself, you will get dirty. I can assure you of that. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourselves to him as an instrument of righteousness. God, I'm your instrument. I want to love you today. I want to obey you today. I want to serve you today. I want to honor you. I want to be a servant of righteousness. Verse 11, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. You and I are in charge of the instrument that we are. Now, here's the, here's the, the, the question that we have to deal with. Are we in charge of the instrument that we are because God gave us permission? Of course. You're not a robot. God did not wind you up and set you into a direction. The Spirit of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God is in your heart and your mind, talks to you through His Spirit and your Spirit to teach you what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go, how to be, how not to be. It's all about following the will of God, living righteously, letting your conduct be of the Lord. Look at number two in your outline. Refreshing usually starts when an individual feels the Spirit of God moving in their heart. You know, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, do, do you know him? The spirit that came into your heart and brought conviction to help you to understand you needed God in your life. The spirit that brought conviction of repentance. The spirit that helps you every day to make a new commitment for God today because yesterday is commitment is an old commitment. It needs to be renewed afresh every morning. The spirit of God that works in your heart to allow you to do those things and and the Spirit of God works in your heart to help you to realize, God, I've got a need. I've got a need. And God, in His Spirit, begins to relate. And the first thing you and God are doing, you're, you and God are talking about you. You and God are talking about what it is He wants in your life. And the Spirit of God begins to bring a conviction, convicts you. Now that, you say, well, Pastor, 
God convicts of sin, doesn't he? Yes, he convicts of sin, but I'm not there yet. I'm talking about to you, God, is con- God convicts you of what it is he wants you to do. Pastor in a church one time that one of the members whose mother was in the nursing home, uh, she had uh, arthritis, some odd form that was just crippled her body. And, and she was a Christian lady. And she had served God, and, and she was actively working in her church as an obedient Christian and doing what God asked her to do. And, and all of a sudden, she finds herself um, beyond the ability to do anything but lie in a bed in a nursing home. And, and I, I, I learned of this lady after I became pastor of this particular church, of course, through the son. And, and so I go by the nursing home to, to see his mom, and, and I discovered something I didn't know. He didn't tell me. And what, he, what I discovered was this little lady, all of 90 pounds maybe, frail, twisted. When I introduced myself to her, She recognized my name and said her son had told me uh, that he had a new pastor. And we talked a few minutes, and I did as I was going to, as I always would have done. I said, you know, I need to move along, whatever I might have said about that. And I said, "Uh, I want to have prayer with you. And she said, raised her little hand, but she could, and she said, No, pastor, no, no. I'm going to pray for you. And then she said, you see, when I became in this condition, I could no longer do nothing for God. It bothered me. And I said to him, God, I want to serve you. Is there something I can do? I don't feel like I can do anything. And she said, God convicted me of one thing I could do. And she said, God told me, I want you to be a prayer warrior for preachers. I permitted her to pray for me. I visited her many times. Not because she needed my visit but because I needed her prayers. Every preacher in that county would go to this lady so she would pray for them. You see, preacher, if that little lady was convicted to pray for preachers, that it would be okay for me to ask God to convict me of something I can do for him. Yes, it would be okay. And by all means, you should. There should be something you feel you do for God. How many times as pastor has someone said to me, Pastor, I just, I just don't feel like there's anything I can do for God. I try to encourage them. I try to give them direction. But I say to every, I say to every situation of that type, I say to every one of them, one thing you can do is pray. Pray for people. Become a consistent prayer warrior for people that you convicted you know you can do. But look at verse no, at number three of our outline. What's your spiritual refreshing look like? I'm going to say the Bible. If your life is refreshed, it should look like the Bible. You should feel like you look like the Bible. You you should feel so spiritually refreshed that you don't feel uh, sinfully condemned. Does that make sense? So spiritually refreshed that you don't feel sinfully condemned. I'm not a smoker, 
so therefore, if, uh, if, I, if I'm in a space where someone is smoking, it's not a problem for me to pick up on, you know, the smoking is taking place. No. A particular gentleman was smoking. He was a cigar smoker. And he quit smoking. And it was, uh, winter time came, and he went to get his winter coat out of the closet. And he said to his wife, my goodness, my coat stinks. She said, well, you stunk for years. <laughs> Jeremiah 23 and 29 says, it's God asking the question, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? If my life is refreshed, it should look like the Bible. People should be able to watch you as a believer and read certain scripture about your behavior. Is my word not like fire? Melting away? purifying the trash that we pick up in life's journey. You don't really have to do anything all bad, just walking through life, rubbing shoulders with people. It's easy to pick up on little things that may seem all right to them, but not pleasing to God for you. His word purifies, cleans, melts away those things that we don't need. But I like this one particularly. The word of God is like a hammer. (laughs) A hammer. What do you usually do with a hammer? You use a hammer to drive a nail. Here he talks about using a hammer to break up the hard spots in our life. As a boy, I grew up in the, in the farm rural communities in Kentucky. Our land was sandstone land, means our rocks were not white, they were brown. And they were soft rock. But Along the way, there would be times that my brother and I would gather rocks to fill into a a particular low place, and with a sledgehammer, we would break the rocks in smaller pieces. So this came to me real strongly. God's Word is like a sledgehammer breaking at the heart and core of our behavior that we may be soft and pliable and usable for God. 2 Timothy 3.16 teaches us that spiritual refreshing should just simply look like people obeying the Scripture. He said all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching. Teaching means helping us to understand what God wants us to look like. Parents want their children to look like them. And that's fair, isn't it? God wants his children to look like him. Isn't that fair? The Bible helps us know how to have relationships. Bible helps us to know how to treat people, how to relate to people. The Bible helps us to know how to control our temper. The Bible helps us to be calm in the midst of a storm.
the Bible is rebuking. It tells us God disapproves of our, of our behavior sometimes. It's used for correcting. It's used for training in righteousness. Look at number four in your outline. Spiritual refreshing is trusting God. The culture around us doesn't want us to trust God. Not really. Your family, your friends will say things like this from time to time. It's okay to go to church once in a while. It, it's okay to believe about God. Just don't get all involved with him and feel like you've got to uh, be like that bunch of people that goes to church all the time. It's all about God. That's the culture of our society. Be very religious, but not committed to God. Religion will not get you to heaven. It will get you to hell. God will get you to heaven and you'll bypass hell. Spiritual refreshing. Job is a person that I want to close with. Job was recognized as the man that was upright, meaning he honored God, he lived for God, he pleased God. And in this moment of Job's life, tragedies begin to happen. He was a rich man. Someone stole his livestock. Fire came. Did its damage. Wind came. Killed his 10 children. His body broke out with boils. His wife turned against him. And then he had three friends. Have you got three friends? <laughs> Probably. More than that. But he had three friends. They're buddies. And they were going to say things like this to Job. Job. If you had done this for God, these things wouldn't have happened to you. Listen to me carefully. Don't blame God when bad luck comes. Don't blame God. Satan has the power in this atmosphere. He will inflict disasters to destroy you. Job said, I know I'm right with God. There's nothing wrong between God and me. I know I'm right with God, and one day I'll talk with God about it. And his friends harassed him, and his friends were critical of him. But notice what the Scripture says in Job 13 and verse 15. Though God slay me, yet will I hope in him. Yet will I trust in him. hope. Job wanted to have a face-to-face -face meeting with God and say, God, I've given my best to honor you and to please you, and I know you have not done this to me. I need deliverance. Now listen to the moment of refreshing. Read the last chapter of Job and you'll find that God restored to Job twice as many camels as he had, twice as many oxen as he had, twice as many sheep as he had, renewed his wife, now that was a blessing, and gave them another set of 10 children. Job 
Job was simply proving to his friends, God is not at fault. You can trust God in hard times. Friends, one of the most refreshing things you can do is learn to trust God in the good times. The hard times will come and you can keep trusting God. Father, in your will, in your name, under the anointing of your spirit, I pray for this people today to reach out to you for a spirit that is refreshing, for a spirit that brings into their hearts and their minds and their bodies a spirit of renewal that they know is from you, a spirit by which they want to live, they want to walk, and they want to be servants to honor you, to please you. Let it happen for Jesus' sake. In your name, amen.